Yes, the voice of a Canadian Treasury Commander, Chris Hatfield. Bowie's space oddity. I think it's one of those moments where you remember where you were when you saw the video of the commander floating in his tin can. And today is a big day. He's done so much, but today the debut album is out. Commander Chris Hatfield. The name of the album is called Space Session Songs from a Tin Can. It's out today. Good morning, Chris. Good, good, I remember where I was when I recorded that I song. I think you probably <laughs> did remember where you were. What does it feel like to hear that now, after you know a year and all of this? Yeah, a couple, a couple, two couple and a half years. years. Those, yeah. those opening chords that uh, after I'd recorded the voice up on Space Station that uh, M. Griner, uh, Southern Ontario musician, put those piano chords in underneath, and they've almost become you know, sort of definitive of how that song's heard by... Uh, a lot of people didn't know the... Like the young original. folks, they don't even know the original, and so they listen to that. So I, I just love listening to how Em interpreted... Uh, she used to sing in Bowie's band, and mm-hmm. so for her to put those chords in was lovely. But yeah, I... I played a lot of music up on the space station, just like I do on Earth, just in spare time, and recorded some songs that I'd written up there, and they've been sitting doing nothing for a few years, and we thought we should at least um, get it out where people can hear what it's like to to uh, to feel being on a space station, to see see what it's like, and, you, and you, the you, albums today. And the albums today. You, you had mentioned that your voice is different when you're in that tin can, and so listening back to it, it yeah. must have been odd. For, was it odd for you to, to hear back? Well, it, it's the weirdest way to do an album, where you record the vocals <laughs> and guitar first, and then you don't touch them. Like, you can't, you don't do anything with it, you just leave the voice alone, and then, uh, and then fill in the instrumentals in the studio with a bunch of studio musicians. Uh, no, no musician would want to record that way. But, <laughs> but it's the whole point of it is mm-hmm. that this is how I felt. This is with the with the weightlessness. Your voice physiologically changes how your your sinuses are full, or how your tongue is swollen, or your vocal cords are swollen. It physically changes how you make noise. So the whole thing, how you play guitar, it's all a little different. But that's the point. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what it's like to be one of the few human beings. Uh, living off Earth. And we've been living on the space station for 15 years. It's kind of a new perspective on ourselves. That's right. Um, The perspective is actually interesting too, because we we heard a a cover, but there are originals on this. The rest of it's all originals. It's all originals. And so um, I I heard in an interview, uh, you you say that uh, I think it changes how you would paint or how you would write poetry, and it definitely affects how you would write music. And you were referring to creating in space. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, uh, part of it is just that you're weightless. You're you're you f- uh, and you feel sort of magic because you can fly. You know, you can tumble and float and fly effortlessly. You're the world's best gymnast. You're <laughs> you're uh, Tinker Bell or whatever. You know, it's just great. And but at the same time, every time you go by a window, the whole world is pouring by. And and there's this when we pull ourselves into the the biggest bulging window on the space station, the cupola, we talk to each other. Like in hushed tones in there. Not it's kind of silly. Why would you? But um, but it's just uh, the sense of uh, of honor and awe to be able to see the world that way. It's as if you walked into the most magnificent cathedral in the world. Uh, but it's like that all the time, and and you see it just straight with your eyes and and the changes of the world and and uh, and it affects how you think it affects how you feel and so it inevitably affects you know how you record uh, all those feelings and thoughts from the get-go you have been so uh generous in bringing all of that to us from the pictures the the hundreds of pictures from the you to the videos that you were sending yeah. um we felt like we were there with you and i think that was the first like that was the first time that i think that we felt like we were part of it because of uh the way that you use technology to communicate with us how important has ha- was that during that mission during that six months to c- be communicating with us well, uh, it it uh, it's still a really new human experience, and, and and you see the world for what it truly is, and it's way too uh, I don't know too big to keep to yourself. And so I tried to think of any way I could to share it, and and so the, all those pictures, I, I made a book of pictures where all my profits go to the Red Cross from that book. But it's just how do you let people see what I saw? And this album, my profits go to music education in Canada. The idea is. This was a really rare human experience. I'm one of the very few people, very few Canadians who's done it. And so uh, how do I let young Canadians see that this is part of reality? This is an actual 
a new way of understanding our place in the world. And any way that I, I mean, I work with schools through Skype every week and I teach at university and, and I, I'm just trying to make sure that the, all of the effort that went into putting me up there isn't wasted. Mm. I'm thinking right now you just told me. I'm not sure if I should divulge this, but you're a new grandpa. I am. That's right. Uh, my eldest and his wife, uh, Kyle, and his wife just had a new baby uh, two weeks ago, so I'm a brand new grandpa. And I just wonder about that baby having Grandpa Chris Hadfield. <laughs> like, what is that like? What are you going to bring to show and tell, little baby girl? Well, <laughs> one, one of the songs on the album is uh, is Space Lullaby, and I wrote it for my daughter because uh, I, I played lullabies for my kids. Uh, you know, every night I was home the whole time they were growing up, and that same feeling when you when you sit on the foot of your child's bed and and play a lullaby for them and you know they they learn about um how music fits into life that way i thought you know the distance is far away but the feeling is still the same and so i wrote that song space lullaby to my daughter Kristen, but now with with a granddaughter so as, as her grandpa i look forward to sitting on the foot of her bed and uh, and playing space lullaby for her so music has always been there for you was it something that oh. like i mean if it wasn't going to be space travel <laughs> would it have been music as a as a as a thing well i i think every musician will tell you just how hard it is to make a living in music right. and so most of us are just in the amateur musician category a lot, everybody appreciates music everybody plays it or hums it or sings it or whistles it to some degree uh and i've i've played in bands my whole life and fronted bands you know played pubs and stuff um and written a bunch of music but um flying in space is so complex still that we it's it's hard to bring anybody up who isn't so technically trained where you've kind of devoted your whole life to it but i'm also a musician and um and to try and, and do my best as one of the early musicians living off the planet to to uh, to try and explain it to myself and hopefully other people can see it a little differently also. It feels like this is another uh, another way to communicate a profound experience and you've done it so well on, on so many levels from uh, the talks that you've done, the books that you've written, all of that, the, uh, the videos, uh, all of the organizations that you've helped out. And I wonder if, about the, the dreams that you, ha- like the things that you still want to fulfill because it feels to me <laughs> <laughs> that things are very you've done in in not you know if i had nine lives i don't think i i would have done <laughs> well, as much well i'm i'm uh i think people uh feel like i'm trying to top something people come up and say oh how are you going to top that i've never i've never tried to top anything no. i'm just trying to uh experience life as fully as i can and uh, be useful and, and feel at the end of every day like hey this was an interesting day i got some cool stuff i learned some stuff and i did some things that i'm that i'm challenged by and and uh, and what am I going to do tomorrow? And and I'm always trying to be learning and and try and help somebody else learn things and and just see what comes along next. And there's all sorts of projects and work and and uh, and there's all sorts of stuff I don't know. But uh, but also at the same time I recognize just how lucky I've been and the privilege I've had. And uh, and so I just see I have a great responsibility to share that as well as I can. Yeah. You dig the jazz? Oh, I, uh, I, <laughs> I, I, uh, my music teacher in high school, she was dating a jazz trumpeter. And one of my, my fir- actually, my very first in studio uh, ever uh, was to a, a jazz recording by uh, Nimmons and Nine Plus Six back in the uh, 70s here in Toronto, watching them record a, uh, I think it was called the Atlantic Suite. But mm-hmm. li- oh, man. And I just, it was, I, I learned more that day probably than in two years of high school. Just, I didn't even know that world existed. And such good musicians but also the whole process of musical creation. 